If you're a fan of my content, you know I'm a pretty edgy guy. I often make jokes about tragedies like school shootings and the Holocaust, I obsess over incel philosophy, and I throw around words like faggot and retard like they're going out of style. Even though they are going out of style, which is the whole fucking point! Sometimes after watching some edgy shit, people need a palate cleanser. Some content that isn't challenging or offensive, but still entertaining nonetheless. We're talking some wholesome, comfy shit. And there are a number of YouTube channels I follow that provide just that. Wholesome, comfy entertainment. So I figured, since I'm constantly bringing the edge into your lives, it's probably my sacred duty to offer a counterbalance as well. So, here are my top five favorite wholesome YouTube channels. And I know this goes without saying, but these aren't the top five most wholesomest channels of all time. I'm only subscribed to like 80 channels. So these are just the top five wholesome channels that I actually watch. Number five, Balrog. Now I know what you're thinking, but monkey, are you telling me the Balrog from Lord of the Rings made his own YouTube channel? And it's wholesome? Uh, no. This is just a nerdy Nintendo fanboy who dresses up as different characters in his bedroom to review Nintendo games and hardware. I've actually been following the Balrog channel for over seven years now. He first piqued my interest with a series of videos about the Pokemon games where he would dress up in a lab coat! Whoa, lab coat! Lab coat! Lab coat! Lab coat! Hell yeah, baby, lab coat! And present a detailed production history and review of each generation. Over the years, Balrog's content has evolved quite a bit, but one thing has always remained the same. Balrog's optimistic, friendly demeanor and love of Nintendo. I mean, this guy loves Nintendo. He has a collection of like 20 Nintendo DS's just because they're different colors. But yes, the main takeaway from this, I want the system to be more fashionable, like the DS and the 3DS. There's a reason that I just collect all kinds of different DS's, like I have a blue DSi, I have a red DSi XL, I have the new 3DS just so I could get face plates with it, like, I have the... this... I have, I have, like, the crystal blue Game Boy Advance SP, like, give me options, please. I love colors, Nintendo, just... Ah! There's nothing cynical or disingenuous about this channel. It's a guy who truly loves a game company enthusiastically talking about their products, and his enthusiasm is contagious. But this isn't to say he's constantly sucking Nintendo's dick and thinks they can do no wrong. In his most recent videos about the Nintendo Switch, he lists off a lot of pros and cons to the console, and even provides some interesting hopes and suggestions for future iterations. Next up is a larger and sturdier kickstand. The current one they have only has one angle, and it's kind of flimsy as it is, you know? That said, I gotta tell y'all a little story. I recently bought a Nintendo Switch a couple months ago because I... <laughs> I sat on my old one on the couch. I was just... I came home from work and the Switch was just on the sofa. I wasn't paying attention and then just... Just destroyed it with the sheer velocity of my butt. So, <laughs> I have a new Switch now. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that it seems that the kickstands have gotten a little sturdier since launch, so I really wouldn't hate if they did this again, but ever since I bought the Switch charging stand, it's been hard to go back. So if you're a fan of all things Nintendo, you'll love this channel. And poor Balrog has been doing this shit for eight years now, and he has yet to reach 100,000 subscribers, which sucks because he definitely deserved that a long time ago. And according to his Twitter, He's planning on upping production on his videos more often than he has been in the last year. So now would be the perfect time to hop on board. If you're in the mood for some old-fashioned YouTube, I would recommend his History of Pokemon videos. Otherwise, you can't go wrong with checking out his newer stuff. Number 4. Charting with Dan. Okay. 
This one is kind of cheating. <laughs> you would know all about that, monkey. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's fair. All right, I know I said these were all gonna be YouTube channels, but this one isn't a channel. It's a show hosted on the Screen Junkie secondary channel, Fandom Entertainment. And now you're definitely thinking, Wow, Mumkey, you're giving a shout out to a channel with one and a half million subscribers run by a soulless corporation. You sure do want to represent the grassroots YouTube community with this video. Look here. Look. Listen. It's not what it seems. I'll admit, the Fandom Entertainment YouTube channel is primarily a soulless product of washed-up wannabe LA entertainers chatting in a semi-circle about cape shit all day. But that's not what I'm recommending. There's a weekly show on this channel called Charting with Dan. And if you're interested at all in the business side of the film industry, I think this show is a must-watch. I absolutely love it. First of all, the titular Dan who hosts the show is anything but a Hollywood shill. He's an Arkansas boy whose greatest passion in life is the film industry. And it shows! He's not only the most genuine guy who works at Screen Junkies, he might be one of the most genuine guys on the internet! He loves talking about the industry so much that he literally jerks off to stats and figures. Every Monday, Dan takes a look at the box office stats of the previous weekend and makes charts about them. Hence the name, Charting with Dan. And he'll take some deep dives to explain, or at least hypothesize, what's going on with the numbers. Why some films failed and other films thrived. And as a guy who sees almost every movie that comes out, I'm always fascinated to see these numbers and hear his perspective on them. If you're a fan of the movie industry and want to hear a genuine person, not a corporation, talk about the box office in detail, you probably won't find a show better than this. I watch it every week, and I hope it keeps getting enough views to justify its existence so that Screen Junkies doesn't force it off the air. Avatar and Endgame, this is the thing we're tracking till the wheels forever. fall off of it forever. Uh, every week we're looking at how Endgame and how Avatar are comparing to each other. Endgame is now just under $300 million, depending, there's always 10, $20 million variants in different sources, but about $300 million behind Avatar for the top highest grossing global film of all time. Again, the, the question remains, it, it hasn't fallen off a cliff to the point where we're gonna say like, well, it's definitely not gonna, right. gonna catch up with Avatar. However, as we just saw, it didn't bury Pokemon. Uh, Detective Pikachu, that opens strongly up against it. We have plenty of other films coming out which have the ability to open up strongly against it. So, $300 million. It's a lot. We say it every week. It doesn't <laughs> seem like a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's holding well enough to still have a shot at it, but it really is going to depend week by week how strong does it play against this competition, how many people are going to keep going back right. and seeing it. Number three, Picastri Yellow. Hello, Internet users! If you're a fan of the Pokemon games, this channel is a must-watch. Picaspri is a channel focused on video games, oftentimes highlighting fan games and ROM hacks that most people never would have heard of otherwise. But where he truly shines is with his Pokemon Challenge videos. First up, you've got his soft lock picking series. A soft lock is when you trap yourself in a game with no possible way to continue. And there are a good number of these in the Pokemon games. For example, in Pokemon Red and Blue, if you challenge the Elite Four with only a Primeape, and the only attack it has PP left for is Rage, and you've tossed all of your items, and you save the game right before your fight with Lorelei, you've essentially just bricked your game. There's no way out of it. You're trapped forever, unable to win or lose, and you'll have no choice but to reset your entire game file. It seems the game is indeed now locked into an impossible state. We're stuck in a room with nothing to do except to enter into an unwinnable battle. There are no items to use, and because we saved in here, reloading won't do us any good either. We're so close to the end of the game, but because we exploited a few design oversights, we now have no way to continue on like the game intended. It seems like the only thing we can do now is start over with a new save file. 
Picaspri makes videos showcasing how to get yourself into these game-ending situations, but then, the absolute madman scientifically and mathematically tries to find ways out of these scenarios without cheating. And some of this shit is fucking glorious to watch unfold. So in order to escape this trap that has been set up, Rage is going to have to miss Dugong 20 times in a row. If it lands even once, then we'll just trigger an endless battle and you'll have to reset and try again. Even if Rage manages to miss while it's in a continuous attack state, the PP will not go down and the move will just resume the next turn. Since Rage has a 0.3891% chance of missing when used just once, the percent chance of this happening 20 times consecutively looks like this. Or, we could just say that this is approximately a 1 in 68 quintessillion chance. With that in mind, notice that Rage missing 20 times in a row has an E notation value of negative 49, while the closest number to this in the other column is negative 47, at attempt number 12. Now, for the majority of you that still have absolutely no idea what the heck I just said, I'll sum it up simply. Assuming the math and my understanding are correct up to this point, you are more likely to encounter 12 shiny Pokémon in a row than to have Rage miss 20 times in a row in Gen 1. In his other Pokémon Challenge video, he actually tries to complete the game, doing runs like Ditto only or Slackoth only. And don't worry, these aren't fucking Let's Plays that will bore you to tears with grinding. These are typically 30 minute videos where he highlights his adventure trying to win the game on super mega hard mode. They're just really comfy and fun to watch. The series of videos that first got me watching his channel is about hidden content in Pokemon games, where he would take a look at maps and items that were included in each game's data, but never appear in the actual game itself. Again, if you consider yourself a fan of the Pokemon games, you're going to enjoy all of these videos a lot. I've rewatched most of them a whole bunch of times. Number 2! Summoning Salts! The Summoning Salts channel is yet again a channel about video games. Yeah, yeah, I get it! The majority of the list is about video game channels, but this is fucking YouTube we're talking about here, folks! 90% of the unoriginal garbage on this godforsaken website is about video games, so cut me some slack here! Summoning Salt stands out from the crowd by making amazing documentaries about the world record speedrun progression of the most popular speedrun games. In case you're uncultured, a speedrun is when you try to beat a game as fast as possible. And there is a huge and thriving speedrun community online constantly fighting to set the fastest records. Summoning Salts does a shit ton of in-depth research into the topic and compiles his findings into 30-minute documentaries about how each game's speedrun record got faster and faster over the decades. It's fascinating stuff, even for games I've never played before. His presentation is very friendly to people who might not know what he's talking about, and he explains the exploits and strategies that speedrunners use in ways that retards like me can actually follow along. Believe it or not, Rainbow Road actually has a second ultra shortcut. It hasn't been done by a human before, at least not yet, but it's probably going to happen someday. It was discovered relatively recently, March 2016, by Esteloy62. You drive slightly forward, then turn around and hop along the tiny space between the outside of the railing and the track. Believe it or not, getting back here is the easy part. The hard part is getting from here to the track below. You must do what's called a spin drift. It's where you drift to the right, then hold the stick back to the left, hop perfectly off the edge of the track, use another mushroom while in the air, and if you do all of that correctly, then you can just barely make it back to the track. If you don't go far enough, you won't go back in the key checkpoint region 0, so the last region won't be loaded and the lap won't count. If you do any of these inputs incorrectly and land short of the track, the trick won't work. Everything needs to be perfect. But technically, nothing here is impossible, and people have come close to doing it before. It's not inconceivable, and it's probably even likely, that someday, someone will pull off the Rainbow Road Ultra shortcut. There's no big success story yet, but just like all the courses before it, the story of Rainbow Road will be written. The only question is, who's going to be the author? 
This has been the History of the Ultra Shortcut. Thanks for watching. What I love about these videos is the sense of camaraderie and friendly competition in the speedrun community. These people aren't selfishly trying to break records on their own. It's a whole community of people working together to find the fastest ways to beat their favorite games. And this spirit of community and friendly competition really shines through in these documentaries. Every video is its own unique story of underdog heroes, epic battles, genius exploits, and video game mastery making Summoning Salts one of the consistently best channels I'm subscribed to. Number 1. Brutal Moose I'm gonna be honest, I'm pretty late to the Brutal Moose fandom. In fact, I only started watching about a year ago, and I haven't really bothered to watch his old videos. Uh, hear me out! I know that Brutal Moose grew his channel doing retro game and movie reviews with a hardcore focus on nostalgic content, but as I look through his back catalog, I don't see many games that I actually played as a kid, so none of it really pops out to me. But one thing I am nostalgic for is food, and that's why my recommendation of the number one most wholesome comfy YouTube channel is Brutal Moose's series of food videos. Every episode he'll choose a topic, like Lunchables, Banquet Meals, or even Frozen Organic Garbage, and he'll prepare, eat, and review an assortment of them. It might seem a bit boring at first glance, but it's the execution of these videos that has me re-watching them over and over again. Ian spends hundreds of hours editing these videos in the funniest ways possible. The presentation is so random and comedic that every 10 seconds, something will happen that you definitely weren't expecting. I don't trust the chicken. I don't trust it. I'm not looking forward to eating it. I'm gonna eat the brownie first. I guess I have to get the, oh no. The stuff that was in the brownie, uh, there's a problem here. That looks disgusting. Now, I know that some of you will say that this is my fault, uh, and you're right. I don't want to eat that. I guess I got to eat that. Okay. Comedy is also derived from reading the online reviews of the various frozen foods, where Ian finds the funniest reviews possible while waiting for his next meal to finish cooking. And it really helps that I have so much nostalgia for shit like kid cuisine and Lunchables and all that. It really feels like he's making these videos specifically to entertain me, and I just really love them. Recently, he has also done some Yu-Gi-Oh! unboxing videos that include the same hilarious editing style, and you guys all know how much I love Yu-Gi-Oh!, so I've enjoyed those videos as well. Even a video of him trying out every claw machine at his local arcade is filled to the brim with wholesomeness and maximum comfy. Whether you need something to take your mind off of things, or you just need something nice to have on in the background, you can't go wrong with the Brutal Food series. Well, folks, those are the five channels I return to most often when I need some wholesome, feel-good shit to watch. They've helped me a lot lately, and hopefully you can get some joy from them as well. In the meantime, if you're excited about part three of my short film series, it's gonna take a little longer to produce than the previous two because I'm actually traveling across the country to interview the people involved in the production. So over the course of the next couple weeks, I'm gonna be in Georgia, Chicago, and Iowa if you need me. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Thank you to all of the patrons who support me over at patreon.com slash monkey, and I'll see you next time, folks.